All right, digital forensics is basically a field of forensic science. That's like the basic explanation for it. Let's, but let's break it down to digital, then forensics. Now, digital, like we know, I don't want to go into the computer science aspect of it, but in a nutshell, talking about digital, talking about zeros or one, talking about electronic devices, right? Now, it actually involves when you, let me say like identification, even preservation or extraction extraction of digital evidence like what mr matthew said i think he was talking so was saying something about digital evidence now what's the aim if we want to like bring out electronic data that can be used for anything you want to bring it out so the process of bringing it out the process of preserving it the process of identifying it the process of even documenting it or interpreting it is what is called digital forensics Later on in the class, I'm going to explain, I'll show you how we can actually, you see a particular file, then we are going to use one or two commands or one or two tools, and we'll see like, okay, these are the different components of the file. Now, there is something, there is something we don't know. Take for example, you have a picture, you upload a picture, you start a picture with your phone, and you upload it to the internet. Actually, the picture has, Apart from the picture made up of pixels, the picture has something they call like metadata, like the metadata, like the I don't like the information that is embedded in the picture. Now, one thing social media platform does, social media platforms do. One thing they do is they normally remove some sensitive information from the um, from that picture before uploading it. That's you want to upload like your profile picture and the likes of that. They remove some sensitive information. Ordinarily, when you take a picture with like a camera, let's say um, Canon, I don't know, I have forgotten the name of those cameras. Let's just say Canon. You take a picture with Canon. Ordinarily, apart from taking the picture, it's going to save, um, it's going to save information about like the 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 the, the device that took the camera, where the longitude and latitude of location, um the time it was taken, different information about, about that picture is going to... So, if, for adventure, you retrieve a picture from the internet, yes, you can always get metadata out of the picture. That's get information out of the picture. But if you retrieve, a, if you retrieve an information from, like, a social media platform, trust me, those information, those things would have been what taken away from the picture. Yeah. Okay. There are different aspects of uh, digital forensics. We are not going to, like, know more that we know that there is... Uh, Computer forensics, network forensics, database forensics, and the and memory forensics like, and likes of them. Yeah. So let's um, talk about the process. That if we want to do it, first of all, we need to identify the evidence or the identify the device. We need to identify the device. Another one, we need to analyze it. Then, if at all we want to document it, fine. Then, if we want to present it to whoever is asking us to, it's it's good. We can always do that. So there are different tools that we use for digital forensics. We are not going to break down everything, but we are going to talk about the little ones that we know. One is Wireshark. We already know how to use that one. We've talked about it in class. Another one is um, autopsy. I'm going to show you how that one looks like. Another one is autopsy. Okay, uh, go with me while I share the screen. So now, if you want to locate autopsy, I'm not going to really do much, do much um, with it. If you want to locate autopsy, autopsy is actually used for it. Like it's like an open source tool. It's used for forensics analysis of disk image. You know what I mean by disk image files, now, like ISO files. Like take for example, you want to install. I think you should know what this image file is. So let's proceed. You go here. Look at that house. Ordinarily, where you want to open an application in your Kali. Then you go to, you just press autopsy. autopsy. It's meant to show. Then you open it. It's going to load in your local host. The load in your local host. But I'm not going to use it for anything. I think I used it a few weeks back to work on something. So that's going to be for password. I put my password there. Then.
So now, look at it. It's asking, like, open an HTML browser on remote host and paste this URL in it. This is URL. Like, it's just, like, it's using our local host. So that's actually what we're going to use to, to use our autopsy control sheets. So let's, let's open um, Firefox. So now, the moment we open Firefox, you will see this process here. This place that I'm lighting, this place here. This place is now going to show something. It's going to show that the autopsy is running somewhere in the background or foreground, as the case may be. If it is, if you are looking at it at the moment, that's, don't worry about it. You know what's foreground and background is. Okay, so we wait for the, yes, the class is being recorded, I mean. So that's autopsy is one of the tools. Another one is in case, while it loads up, I'm going to paste the URL there. So we have in case we have there's another one that they call FTK. That one is forensic forensic uh toolkit. It's called FTK. So I was asking me for my password particularly. Shouldn't be asking for my own password, but generally that's the password for your Kali. That's if you've never changed it, it's Kali K K E L I. Also, when the terminal is prompting you for a password, it means you want to elevate your privilege to be a root user. That's um it's also Kali, K-E-L-I. That's if you've not changed it. So that's that how that. All right, it has loaded. Now, all we need to do is come to the, um, where we input our URL, and I'm going to put the URL that we copy from there. So put the URL there. The moment we do that, it's going to load up the Kali. Mind you, look at this. It's actually waiting for us to run this URL. That's how to use your autopsy. In case there is need for you to use autopsy, it's quite simple to use. It's a GUI tool. You see? So I'm going to press enter now. I press enter, it loads up. Then you will see that here, um, you see that. So I'll answer all the questions later. I'll answer the questions later. While it's loading, here the process is going to start to run. So I know it started running. Now you can see, or oh, it's giving me a warning that your browser currently has JavaScript installed or enabled. You don't need JavaScript to use Autopsy and Shikon. It's turned off for security reasons. Um, come on, it's Shikon Rest. I, I used it before and I didn't, did I turn it off? I'm not sure I did. So now you go here, you see that the, 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 the processes should be, not only yet, okay. Although this is not where you're not running, you're not using it on the CLI tool. Though. It's not on the CLI tool you're using it. This is actually where you're going to be using it. So now you have open case, you have new case, you have help. So you want to work on something, you actually come here, you open a case. When you open a case, that's uh, from there you can actually like um move forward and do whatever it is you want to do. So now it's asking you for your this like it's a GUI tool. Any GUI tool, they shouldn't like let me see be explaining how to go about it step by step. Moreover, if you have any issues with it, you can just um uh, easily contact let me see, you can use chat GPT, you can get help from wherever wherever it is you want to get help from. So I think this B1 and B2, they were actually the case I I worked on. They were the case I worked on before. So if you want to do for yours, you go to new case, you select the case, they must start providing you with a file. That's the file that you're working with. After now, I will talk about the concept of file deletion and the likes of that. So that's that about it too. Like I said, I talked about NCase. That's another tool that is used for it. 
uh, most of the time you don't generate a case. Yeah, they actually send um send it to you. Like I'm just talking. I'm talking from experience. It could be that um, there are other case scenarios. From my own experience, I was given the I was given the stuff to work on. You get so you can give it the case number, give it the description, the investigation investigator names. It's not really necessary, anyways. But you can just put it there if you want to put it there. If you notice some questions I'm not answering ASAP, there are those questions I can't really see them completely. If I see a question like from beginning to the end, what I'm talking about, I'll just explain it completely. But if I can't really see it from beginning to the end, I'll probably come back later to um to to attend to it. So you fill in these details, then you what then you um new case. It's gonna ask you to it's gonna ask you to um to select the file that that's where is the file located? They must have sent the file to you. That's those you're working with, probably FBI. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so, so like I said, we have other stuff. We have NKS, we have FTK, we have Wireshark, which we know how to use. We have volatility. That volatility too is very, very important. I think we we'll use volatility at the point in this class. We use volatility. So now, what are the challenges in D2 forensics? What are the challenges? Uh, ordinarily, encryption is a challenge. Most of the time, files are encrypted. Another one is data volume. I actually face that challenge. I would like data volume means like take for example, you are working with a file of two gig. You are working with a file of two gig. So you should know that the stores that you are going to analyze with plenty. There's there's this tool I used. Yes, please work with me while I show you this one. This is actually used for um, databases. Take for example, you want to talk, you want to you want to work on databases. I'll just show you on my desktop screen. I won't show you, like, I won't load up the tool or use it for anything whatsoever. But I'll show you on my desktop screen. I seriously don't know how to go to desktop. All right. How do I share my desktop? Okay, I don't know if you can still see my screen. Okay, good, you can, you should be able to see it here. Okay, good. The name is DB Browser, there's for SQL Cypher, then there's DB Browser SQLite. I think just downloading one of them will give you the two of them. So just type DB browser, like database browser. It's also like a very good data forensics tool. You get so it's used for working on databases. I know sometimes now they use SQL to write all these or to dry all these data databases, like all those things that they store in the in, in database is actually used for viewing it. So now, like I said, one of the challenges is like uh, I'm, I'm referring to these these two tools. Database browser, then for SQL Cypher, then database browser, SQLite. Yeah. So, that's that on that. So, we already know the problems that we can most likely face. Yeah. Now, another problem is anti forensic technique. Like now, um, just the way we have, just the way. We know about it. Some people can actually, that's people that don't want to get hold of the data, they can actually like wipe the file. So they can perform what they call steganography. Steganography means like hiding a file in a file that's making the work just complicated. Yes, my plan at the beginning of this class was to explain or demonstrate stegan steganography to us, like to hide a file in a file. But um, I think, yes, I know, Toby, but I, I took it away. Um, uh, yes, I went through my laptop and I think I've already uninstalled those tools that I normally use for steganography, but I don't use it like quite often. Yeah, so we already know the applications of D2 forensics. We know the applications. We know what we use them for. Now, let me explain one key concept in D2 forensics, which is what the concept of 
file deletion. The concept of file deletion. First of all, I, the, the way I just said it, um, can someone can someone explain to me what I mean by file, file, file deletion? Just, just basic explanation, what we already know. Can someone explain to me the concept of file deletion? Yes, divine. Yes, please um, increase your volume if you can. Okay, file deletion just has to do with the deleting the file from your system or removing it to your recycle bin and or out of the recycle bin, as the case may be. All right, yes, that's the basic. Thank you very much, Divine. That's the basic explanation for file division. Yeah. It said, what it said is that file deletion means removing the file from wherever it is located, then it goes to recycle bin. Then if you want to take it further, it deletes it from recycle bin, then it goes to, then it disappears. That's the basic explanation or understanding of what we know. But data forensics class now is going to like give us one new knowledge, which is, which if you don't know it before, just know that there's actually a misconception about file deletion. I think I've talked about it before. Yeah, when I was talking about um, what, when people upload stuff to social media platforms, the, yes, the best word to use is actually file relocation, actually, is what I think. So take, for example, you upload something naughty on the on Facebook server or something. When you think it has, you've taken it down, truthfully, once you've created it, it's not, you don't, you know, the way you create, when you think you sort of create is to, like, you know, uncreate or wipe out completely. That's not actually the case. That's what, like, a newbie will assume. Yeah, okay, I have a file, then I am deleting the file, then it has disappeared completely. That's not actually the case. It's, it doesn't go that way. Now, when you now, as a user or a person, when you, when you delete a file from your computer, they are often um, assumed to be permanently gone, right? But in digital forensics, we know that deletion doesn't um, doesn't actually mean that the data is entirely released. Instead, the file's data is usually on the storage device until it is overwritten by new data. Yes, I think now I can remember very well that we've talked about it before. But then, I'm not sure I explained it um, completely. Let me use this opportunity to like break it down in a way that you understand. Now, file deletion operating system. This is how it's um, so when you delete a file, basically the operating system typically removes the reference to that file, just like a pointer to that file from the file's system directory structure. A perfect example of what I'm talking about is like FAT. If you must have heard of FAT, like file allocation table, yeah, file like uh, the FAT system, or if you've heard of if you've heard of NF. N NTFS, yes, NTFS, 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 yeah. So the actual data blocks where the file is stored are not immediately wiped out. That's contrary to what we know. So the file system marks that um, marks the space previously occupied by the file as free. So most of us we think that the file has gone. Uh -uh. What it's doing is it's just mark that space that is occupying as free, which means that a new data can be used to overwrite that particular space. I don't know if what I'm saying is making sense. That is, the file system marks the space previously occupied by the file as free, which means that it can be overwritten by new data. So now, until this space is overwritten, the file data is still present on the disk and can be recovered. I'm sure I've like broken it down to a way that you understand it perfectly. You created a document, or let's say you took your, you took your, you took, you snapped yourself. Probably is is an explicit picture which you are not meant to expose to the uh, public or something. Now you, let me let me quickly take it far. Let me take it far to Snapchat level. So you upload it on Snapchat. Now the idea is that when you delete it, you are thinking it has, it has wiped out, it has erased completely. Uh-uh. 
what it will just do is just like the file system. It's just going to mark the space. The space that that stuff occupied is going to mark it like it's going to mark it free. It's not as if it's going to remove that file away from that place. That file is still there. But it's just going to mark that. It's just like a pointer. The pointer is just like a traffic light. Traffic light is telling you green, red. So, so, so the idea that when it is red, let's just say, well, let's just say when it is red, the, the, the space is filled up. When it is green, the space is empty. You now put a picture inside the card or memory card. The thing is now showing you red. That is, it's filled up. Oh, it's filled up. You now take, according to you now, you want to delete it. Ah, this picture is explicit. It's bad. The public must not see it. You now delete that picture. In your mind, the picture has gone. Uh-uh. The picture is still there. The pointer will just show you green. Green means, hello, this space is free. You can put another file there. It's not as if that thing has gone away. Uh-uh. It's still there. That's what, if you override that data, somebody with skills or right tools or expertise can just like retrieve that stuff comfortably. So you get the idea now. So the server will just, or the system will just mark that place as free. You just mark it as free. When it marks it as free, unless you overwrite it with new data, the file data is still present there. Now, why are they not um, completely, why are deleted files not completely removed? Um, like I said before now, the files are not actually, um, they still remain on the disk or wherever it is until it is overwritten. Yeah, and it can be recovered with the necessary tools. So the process of actually overwriting data is not automatic. It takes time. Yeah, it takes time actually. Don't think that if you put a new picture there, it has automatically overwritten that one. No, 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 no. Even the parts of the file are overwritten, fragments still remain. Yes, they still remain. Yeah. And um, in certain storage areas like Slack space, that one Slack space means um, unused space in a disk cluster. Yeah. Remnant of deleted files can still exist. So that's why it's very, very much easy to recover files. Now, what are the digital forensic tools you can use to recover files? Foremost is one of the photo is part of it and the likes of that. We are going to treat it um, right about now in when we are when we are when we move to the practical aspects of of this okay so let's touch one or two um one or two examples of how we can make use of how we can make use of digital forensic tools so if you have your Kali with you you can as well just follow up or follow up why we do it. Just, uh, 